And there is the sense that it is money uh, that solves the problems, and it is the money that's important. Uh, and yet, we know, and I think all of us would, would agree, uh, that it is ideas that are more important, that are policies that are more important. And in fact, the main direction of our work is, uh, is in the idea and policy area, to try to persuade, for example, a government of a policy that will have all girls in school, or to work with them to implement a policy of having all girls in school. Uh, the other, the, the second part of the answer that I would give is that there has been quite a dramatic change over the past 10 years. So that 10 years ago, most of the bank's lending would have gone directly to implementation by government ministries. But a very substantial amount now is implemented by non-government organizations. And my own work has been focused on trying to build a very complex kaleidoscope of partnerships that involves uh, faith organizations. So for example, in our work in HIV AIDS, we know that it is communities and private sector and faith organizations and NGOs that, have, that must be the people that interact with people to change behavior or to provide support to orphans and children uh, and to adolescents. And therefore, the money that flows, flows to a government which is encouraged to manage a process where at least half of those resources go to communities and to non-government organizations. So it is a very complex set of partnerships that are what we consider the best practice, what works best in the countries and the many countries where there are exciting, uh, extraordinary things happening today. Okay, both of you want to make a commentary, I know. You start, short. <laughs> yeah, a short, brief commentary from what is called the field. Clearly, we're all different people here among the panelists, and we come from different backgrounds. Uh, but when we talk about human rights, we are in, all in agreement. But when, when we look at cooperation, we see that representatives of the, of the general federal government, for example, f fly to Nepal and they meet uh, Nepalese government representatives. They're people from the same class, the same caste, who are meeting there. Uh, and that's what happens in, in reality. The people who are trodden underfoot, whose, vi whose uh, human rights are violated, don't actually have a voice. Uh, NGOs are barely come into it and people from the ordinary people are simply are simply shut out by the security barriers. So there are two different kinds of discourse going on when we talk about human rights. Kenneth yeah. Roth. Let, let me try to address what I think is sort of the old-fashioned way of looking at economic development, which is very much enshrined in the charter of the World Bank. If you look at the World Bank's charter, it says, basically, we don't deal with politics. We only deal with economic development. As if you can have development over here and politics over there, and the two have nothing to do with each other. Um, now, I should say that, that both Jim Wolfenson, the last president of the bank, and, and Paul Wolfowitz, the current president, understand you can't maintain that distinction. But many of the governments that control the bank still try to keep the two apart. And let me give two examples about the problem of that. Um, first is from Angola. Um, Human Rights Watch did a report recently showing that Angola, which should be a rich country because it has all this oil revenue, $4 billion of revenue disappeared. Nobody knows where it is over a five-year period. That's the same amount of money that Angola spent on all social services for its people, just out the window, or probably into a Swiss bank account. Um, <laughs> now, um, you wouldn't have that if you had a government that had a transparent system that was accountable, where people could debate how to spend the money, where they knew where the money came from and where it went. So you need a free political system. You need a civil society. You need a free press for development reasons, because otherwise the money disappears. Another example. Um, I was in Rwanda um, a few years ago, 
and I was driving around on these incredibly bumpy roads, and you know, my skeleton was shaking, and it was, you know, I could just imagine how awful it was for farmers to try to get their food to market. And suddenly, I got onto this road, which was beautiful. It was paved. I could go fast. And I asked somebody, where did this road come from? And, and they said, oh, that's the German government road. It goes, it goes to the former president's village. Now, you know, who decided to spend money on that rather than on other things? This is what happens when you don't ask the people of a society what they need, but you just ask the government. Again, you need the freedom for people to be able to guide their development projects, to tell the World Bank, to tell the German government what it is that's most needed in that society so that it can develop in a way that really helps people the most. But, can I throw? Um, would you expect the World Bank to put more pressure on those governments? Um, yes. I, I, I think that um, the World Bank or the IMF should be a two-way street. It's a bargain. You know, if, if a government wants to receive this aid, it needs to do its part of the bargain to make sure that the aid goes to benefit the people not into the pockets of government officials. It's as simple as that. You're throwing away money unless you set up a system where the money is going to benefit people. And so I think that the World Bank and the IMF should be absolutely strict and, and sign contracts, basically. You've got to free your press. You've got to allow civil society organizations to exist. You've got to have transparent accountability within your, your fiscal system. You've got to have free elections. These are the things we know that make development money actually go to development. Ken, you know as well as I do uh, that these are issues that play out in different ways in different countries and that the World Bank, first of all, is deeply involved, probably more involved than any other global institution in trying to address the issue of corruption at a practical government level, uh, that there are countless cases of where we have suspended or not done or withdrawn or done much less than we should have uh, than we would like to for the poverty purposes because we cannot be confident that the resources are being well used and that we're trying to work towards systems that will work well. Likewise, I think you know that there are thousands and thousands, uh, if not hundreds of thousands, of specific efforts that are directed to comp participation and to engagement, uh, to processes uh, that are trying to hear uh, the voices of the people. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that there are different institutions that have different responsibilities. And uh, the World Bank tends to shy away uh, from what we now call the P word, which is politics. Uh, they, uh, that uh, because uh, we are our board, our, our owners, the governments concerned, do not want us to get into issues of freedom of the press because they view those as the province of, of others. But the fact is that, for example, we have conditionality in a number of cases on publication of the government budget. Uh, we are engaged in country after country in where the budget will be spent. And if you've read recently about the case of Chad, uh, that uh, there was a case where uh, the, there was a very formal, elaborate legal agreement that the government would uh, direct its resources to social sectors, to education and health, and to saving the money from oil for future generations. But that's the tragedy of it, that the government renounced that agreement. Uh, the government said they needed the money for security and for present needs. And what that, has, what that means uh, is that we are not operating. All of our operations in Chad are at a standstill. So what I would hope that we would come away as we see this from our different perspectives is that these are very complex problems. And if we don't recognize the complexity, if we don't respect the efforts that each of us is making the field, uh, in, uh, the, I, I admire your work tremendously. Uh, but we also need to see what we can do from the chairs where we're sitting uh, and what, how we can best use both the resources and the influence that we have. Möchte da Sie fragen, Dr. Noor? Could I ask you, Dr. Noor? There are so many players.